Hello and welcome to Partnerships and Innovation, delivering a clean and resilient project. That's a win-win. I am so pleased to welcome Jerry Cantor here from Amoresco. She's here to talk about the partnership between Amoresco and Holy Cross Energy with Colorado, Colorado Mountain College. It gives me great pleasure to welcome her to our event today. Jerry, thank you for being here with us. Um, before we really jump into the questions, I'd love for you to give us somewhat of a background of how you got to be where you are today with Amoresco. Sure. Thank you, Jessica. So I am a developer for Amoresco. I do development for solar PV and battery storage projects, and I've been with Amoresco for about nine years. Uh, my entire career, though, has been in sustainability. Uh, prior to that, I worked in sustainable investment, and I worked at a university doing greenhouse gas data emissions reductions. Fantastic. And what do you think has been the biggest driving force in your career? Um, I think, honestly, uh, feeling that climate change is a huge problem that I want to address. And frankly, I just cannot develop these projects fast <laughs> enough. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. So let's talk a little bit about this project that actually did uh, receive an award as a top uh, project of the year from ENE Leader. So congratulations for that. Um, so can you just tell us a little bit about how this project, you know, came to fruition, the starting of it? Just go into mm -hmm. some details. Yes, yeah, so in this case, the credit goes entirely to Holy Cross Energy. They have a 100% carbon-free electricity goal by 2030. And now in this case, the project started even prior to that when they were under their uh, 70 by 2030 platform. Um, and they don't just have an aspirational goal, they have strategies behind it to be sure that they could achieve it. So as of last year, Holy Cross reported that they have reached 53% renewable energy in the energy portfolio, and 13% are from local projects such as this one. That is absolutely fantastic. Um, and can you go into a little bit more about how and explain how it was determined to actually lease land from Colorado Mountain College. Is that a common practice within Amoresco in terms of bringing in those ex other partners? So we do typically lease uh, other land, not always, but we do. Um, in this case, that was forward thinking on the part of the college themselves, as well as a nonprofit uh, local uh, Carbondale based CLEAR, they're called. So it's a clean energy for the local economy. And they together saw a developer for this property. Now, in this case, Amoresco as a developer did see a lot of benefits from this property. It is in a good location for multiple reasons. Um, it is immediately adjacent to the tie-in to the distribution grid. Um, it is also relatively remote. So I personally, I find solar PV beautiful for what it represents, but not everybody does. And in this case, this, the site is not visible to any residential areas, uh, anyone along a public way. As a matter of fact, our neighbor is the Spring Valley Sanitation District and they are a great neighbor. Um, and it's also good for other reasons. Not any property is suitable for an energy project. So if a, a property has wetlands or sensitive habitat or um, floodplain or anything else, we would want to use it. In this case, none of that was an issue here. Uh, the property does have some wintering habitat for elk and mule deer, um, which are plentiful in Colorado, but we worked out an arrangement with Colorado Parks and Wildlife where this project is funding a habitat mitigation project of an equivalent acreage at another location. So this is a really great site. Um, and it also has a couple other nearby uses. So there's a, a mountain bike path there, for instance. So any energy project could have dual use either on the site or nearby. And in this case, that mountain bike uh, path was slightly relocated for this project, um, but it's used by the college students and by the local community. Which it's, it's absolutely fantastic. I'd love to hear more about the uh, wildlife um, habitat that you are, you are helping to create. Is that, um, is that gonna be uh, moving animals to that? area kind of relocating them or if you could talk no. I mean and you might not have all the answers for this but I'd love to hear a little bit more about this because I think it's 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 great to mention those type of initiatives because it's something that other companies can really learn from. 
Sure, we had several conversations with uh, the regional representatives for Colorado Parks and Wildlife. And what we agreed to do is, is fun. So MRS goes and doing the project itself and therefore I don't know all the details, but it's called a habitat mitigation project. And I believe it's at a location called Toner Creek. Um, so it's run by CPW, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, um, and it, it improves the wintering habitat in another location of an equivalent acreage to this site, which is a 22-acre complex. That was going to be my next question, if you could tell us how large it was. I mean, I know people can read about it in the awards book, but it, it's great to be able to talk about that during our conversation. So what were some of the initial solutions that were considered? And then how did you determine what was going to be implemented? What was going to be the best choice? Sure. Um, so initially, we had looked at a couple of different durations for battery storage, and we had multiple discussions with Holy Cross Energy. We had proposed both a two-hour and a four-hour duration. So by way of an explanation, a two-hour duration battery could run at its peak capacity for two hours, or it could run at a lower capacity for a longer duration. Um, in this case, we ultimately landed on a three hour duration system as the most optimal combination of cost and duration. So when you add duration, you add cost. Um, but in this case, Holy Cross's energy's purpose for the battery was uh, peak reduction. And so a longer duration battery better serves that use case. Um, so that's the battery. And then this is paired with solar PV and the solar was influenced by the terrain of the site and the acreage of the site. So we have in this case about 13,500 bifacial solar modules on site. And we have a mix of both what's called fixed tracker and single axis tracker, fixed tracking, and single axis tracker. The fixed tracking can better handle the terrain, um, but the single axis tracker rotates, follow the sun from east to west on a daily basis and thereby you're increasing generation. So the site uh, drove some of the decisions we made as well as the use case for the battery from Holy Cross Energy. Well, it definitely makes sense. We have, I live in Maryland outside of DC and we live in the, in the country. And in the past few years, we've had solar farms pop up around us. And it is, it all of the solar arrays do change directions based on the sun. So it, it's neat to see just as a, as a consumer, we have solar on our house as well. Um, so it's just, it's neat to see, you know, at the, on the residential side too, just the benefits, you know, and, and people really coming to um, understand and appreciate the value of having renewable energy sources. So, you know, it's, it's great to be able to make those make those connections. Can you elaborate just a little bit more on the solar um, uh, battery energy storage system complex and the, just the project of the work? I know you talked a little bit about the terrain, but if you could give us a few more details, that would be great. Sure, I'll talk a little bit about how the battery and solar project are set up. So in this case, the battery, the use case, the primary use case for Holy Cross Energy is to discharge into the system peak. Um, the solar solely charges the battery. So all the solar generation will go into the battery. If there's a little bit of excess, it'll go right directly to the Holy Cross grid. Um, so in this case, what the battery is doing, it is shifting the useful solar generation from the midday when load happens to be lower to the evening hours when you have the system peak. So batteries are really useful for that purpose. You can take renewable energy generation when it is generating, and save it and use it for when you actually need it. Um, and that's the case here. That is what we have uh, done. So we've got four, uh, four containers uh, housing 68 battery stacks on site. And then as I mentioned previously, about 13,500 bifacial solar modules. Excellent, excellent. And how have you really seen this, this project um, work and, and benefit you know, all stakeholders involved in terms of generating power. If you could talk a little bit more you know, just about you know, the conversations that you have internally with the different stakeholders. Sure. Um, first of all, as far as direct benefit to uh, the Holy Cross membership, um, first of all, this is a, a clean, clean source of energy using solar energy. Um, we estimate that over the course of a year, it should reduce about uh, 6,800 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. And for context, context that's about removing 1,480 passenger vehicles from the road. 
Um, and then it also will save the entire membership uh, money over the term because using the battery to reduce the system peak reduces Holy Cross's uh, wholesale energy costs. So that is beneficial for the entire membership. Oh, 100%. Yeah, no, great. It is it is nice to when you put into context. I know we get that with our reports from our personal house. How many iPhones have we saved in terms of charging hours? And it, it, it is really neat as a consumer to to really look at those benefits and see how we are making a difference in the overall environmental impact and carbon footprint. It does help to provide that context. I mean, megawatt hours is not necessarily a <laughs> metric exactly. that most people use on a daily basis. So. Exactly. It, it, it's good to be have, have those uh, relatable terms in here. I'm going to go back a little bit to the battery storage um, market. Can you talk about what the some of the changes you've seen in the storage market, battery storage market, and then what do you foresee for the future, whether it be the next, you know, five, 10 years? Where do you see really this market grow, going? Sure. So Holy Cross is really a leader in Colorado as far as utility scale battery deployment. Um, as of last year, I believe more than more than half, about 55%, according to Deloitte, of battery uh, operating battery capacity at a utility scale was in California, um, with much lower percentages scattered across other states. You also see a lot in the Northeast. Um, and that's to be expected because battery deployment is really driven by local policy as well as sources of revenue. Now, last year, we had the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, and that for the first time ever gave standalone battery storage, so meaning it doesn't have to be directly paired with renewable generation, uh, made it eligible for the investment tax credit. So that, along with many other provisions in that legislation, is going to be a real boost to the battery market, both standalone and paired with renewable energy. And you'll see batteries being added to existing renewable energy storage, renewable energy projects as well. Um, so there's absolutely going to be a huge boost. But that said, it's worth noting that even before passage of that legislation, uh, utility scale battery was growing rapidly in the country. So from 21 uh, to 2022, we doubled the operating capacity. And that's really because batteries are just so useful. <laughs> they function both as load and as generation. And they also uh, respond in milliseconds, which means they can provide grid services, grid support services to utilities and grid operators. And so the actual use case you see for a battery depends on the region it's deployed in. Um, but regardless of that, where it's deployed in its use case, batteries have other features that make it relatively easy, easy to deploy compared to, say, another generating facility or a fossil fuel plant, right? It has a small footprint, um, so you can place it right in your load center. They're modular, so they're scalable. Mm -hmm. uh, and the small footprint also means you can actually get through permitting and, and get it installed relatively quickly. So we're going to see a lot more of that. One of the things I had mentioned earlier as well is that this battery was a three hour duration. So we've got a five megawatt, 15 megawatt hour battery. One of the things that I'm personally pretty intrigued about is longer duration storage. So this is a lithium ion battery um, and that technology has been pretty widely deployed in the last couple of years for stationary applications. But it tends to top out uh, at around four to six hours after that it gets quite expensive. And so the industry is really interested in long duration storage. There's some uses where that's really important. So where it can provide that peak capacity for 10, 12, 24 hours. Uh, the DOE actually has a long duration moonshot project going. And so I've seen lately a lot of pilot projects um, with utilities for long duration storage. And I'm personally really intrigued to see where that goes. And I think we're gonna start to see a, a wider variety of battery projects being deployed, not just um, smaller lithium ion projects. Which, it, which is absolutely wonderful to hear. And something I did not mention before is to all of our attendees who are here today, if you have any specific questions for Jerry, please put them in the Q&A chat. If we don't get a chance to get to those questions, um, I know that a member of her team will follow up with you, but please ask any questions related to the content that we're discussing, and we'll be happy to get back in touch with you. And this is a very quick conversation. It's going by extremely fast, <laughs> fast today. This is a unique project, right? A very unique project for a variety of reasons. Can you talk to us a little bit about 
Um, what really makes it unique when you compare it to other energy product projects maybe that you've worked on or ones that you have read about? Sure. So um, as I mentioned, this project is solely charged by the solar generation, and that's not the case for all battery projects. It is for some. And that might be more typical for, say, maybe a behind the meter pairing. Um, when you pair uh, batteries and solar, you might do it in multiple different ways. There's ways called DC coupled, AC coupled. This is AC coupled. Um, what else? Um, <laughs> this is unique to the way we structured the contract with Holy Cross Energy. We have a power purchase agreement with them for a 20 year term. Um, and it does bring in lots of stakeholders, as we discussed previously Holy Cross, uh, entire membership, the college. Um, the college, for example, we haven't talked about that. In this case, the battery is not directly tied into any college building. So we're not directly serving college's load. But that doesn't mean it doesn't provide a direct benefit, it does. And so one of the really excellent and unique features of this project is oh. that the college came to an agreement with Holy Cross Energy, whereby Holy Cross will retire renewable energy credits, known as RECs, mm -hmm. on the college's behalf, equivalent to the full electricity used for three of their campuses. So it's Aspen, Spring Valley, and Vail Valley, um, which means the college is well on their way towards their 2050 carbon neutrality goal, they will own that renewable electricity and they can claim that those campuses are entirely powered by renewable energy, even though the energy is directly going into the grid. Which is a, a, it's unbelievably remarkable. And the, the partnership is, is something that I think, you know, needs to be explored in every single state and you know there are there are the resources there available so this is a fantastic model on which other campuses and energy partners can build on um, and again you mentioned that this is helping Colorado Mountain College's uh, goal of becoming completely carbon neutral by 2050 which is a goal of many many not just universities and colleges but organizations and worldwide companies I know we're coming close to the top of our time here, but, you know, I, I and this is one of the ways I always like to end events is, you know, takeaways. What are some big takeaways that you have for our attendees and not just takeaways, but advice or recommendations that you would love to share with our with our audience regarding whether it's implementing their own energy projects to promote sustainability and resiliency and, you know, just the overall picture, just some some key takeaways. Sure. Um, well, we have a diverse audience, so I'll give a, a few comments. Um, if, if you're a utility or an electricity end user, like an industrial or commercial entity, um, think about what you really want is probably a service more than a particular technology or a particular project configuration. Um, and sometimes that means the less splashy solution like energy efficiency. Um, I love solar batteries, uh, but it's really good to look at the whole gamut of options for reaching your goals. And something like an all source procurement is a really good tool for that. And that's, you know, many states actually already encourage or even mandate that if you're a regulated utility. If you are a planning commissioning member or um, in a permitting authority, you are going to see many more battery storage projects and renewable energy projects. And not all jurisdictions have figured out how they want to permit them. Um, many have, uh, but in particular with standalone battery storage, which as I mentioned, we'll be getting a boost from the IRA. Um, it would be good to plan ahead and start thinking about how you want to permit these types of projects. Um, and then if you're a developer, you already know it's going to take you longer than you think to get a project done. Um, but don't yes. underestimate <laughs> the time it takes uh, for commissioning a project like this. Um, the communications and the software can be more complex for like a battery and solar project than a standalone renewable energy project, for instance. And no matter who you are, don't wait, start now. <laughs> we uh, I, I think all great, all, all great advice and, you know, a perfect way to end this session. Again, thank you, Jerry, for being here. Appreciate working with you as well as the entire team from Amoresco. It's always a pleasure to work with everyone from the company. Uh, for our attendees, thank you for joining today. Any follow-up questions, please feel free to add in the chat or the Q&A box now. And we will follow up with you as soon as we can. And don't forget to visit Amoresco in their booth and check out some more information about this uh, 
project that again was awarded a, product, a project of the year from our judges this year at the, for the awards program. And again, thank you for our attendees being here. And if you are watching this on demand, still submit questions because we will send those questions to the team. So we appreciate everybody's time today and have a wonderful day. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you.